and OCIC is an expanding community for members and individuals who work towards global social justice and sustainable development. And Money Talks has been um, a really long time project here in OCIC to talk about how do we diversify funding strategies and you know how we can learn more about not just fundraising but also grant making and best practices. So I'm very happy that we can have everyone here today and super happy to have Ken. I think Ken could you know introduce himself a little bit later but I think if you have been following OCIC's Money Talks you will know that Ken has been the core contributor or of our last three issues. So uh, without further ado, I think I will pass on the mic to Ken. And um, after the presentation, we do have some time for Q&A. So if you have a question, um, write it down. And later on, when I open the floor, you can put it into the chat box. All right? Okay, Ken, it's all yours. Uh, Ken, you have to unmute yourself. It's at the, yeah. It's at the, um, the left bottom of your There space. we go. Hello, everybody. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm Ken Wyman. I'm your guest for the day with uh, some information to share. Um, we will uh, have these slides available for you to download, and I think Elisa will uh, arrange to email them to you later. Uh, you can also contact me. My information is on screen, and I'm going to read a lot of the information because I understand there are some participants who are on the phone and can't see the screen. So you can reach me by email at ken underscore wyman at yahoo.ca. My phone after the meeting, please, 416-362-2926. A working as a consultant and a fundraiser for 40 years, including five years at Oxfam as National Coordinator of Fundraising Publicity. I've written or contributed to 12 uh, with me a few days ago. We'll cover bits of that again and get into some more detail. We'll look at the costs involved in grant seeking, grant writing, labor, time, money. Uh, we'll think about how an organization should budget for it. And what do you do when the funder doesn't want to hear from you without an invitation and there's no call for proposal? I also ask that we have a brief conversation about dirty money and ethical issues. And I have some interesting ideas for you on how we can share our lessons with funders and grantors and how we can share what we learn with each other. Then we've got time for your questions and ideas. And finally, I've got some links for some more resources that you may find useful. So that said, let's plunge into some common mistakes. One of the most common mistakes people make when they talk about foundation fundraising is they overestimate the amount of money. Uh, let me give you the bad news. Foundations, looking at their giving to all charities, not just international development, only about 0.5% of all charity revenue. That's about half of what corporations give, although unfortunately corporations tend not to give very generously to international development. It's about one quarter of what charities get from other charities, the kind of thing where Oxfam funds a Save the Children project and Save the Children funds a, um, I don't know, a World Accord project. Um, David Barth can let me know if that's ever happened. Um, it's about one twentieth of what charities get from individual giving and underestimating foundation giving. I did a little research in the last few days and found over 130 foundations based in Ontario that give to international development. 
a little bit more about that in a moment. So there is definitely funding out there for international development. And since not everybody is here concerned just about international government, looking at only charities, so we're not talking about nonprofit groups, um, government funds about half of all charity revenue. We'll break that down for you in a, little, in a moment with more detail. Individuals, about 11%. Corporations, 1%. And I know that seems like not very much considering all the publicity corporations get every time they get a donation, but they have great PR departments. Foundations, as I mentioned, 0.5% of charity revenue. Other charities, more than corporations and foundations combined, if you believe it. And the combination of fees and earned income, everything from tuition fees and co-op housing rent, 36% um, for a whole bunch of those sorts of things. All of the hospital parking lot fees would go in there as well. So that brings us out to almost 100% with some rounded figures. You can click on the link if you like uh, later on uh, when we send you the slides and, and go to the sources. Um, now, let me break that down further. That was slightly older data, but the best we have. New data from 2017 takes a look at all nonprofits, and about half of those are registered charities. So there are three kinds of nonprofits. Government hospitals, universities, and colleges get about 73.2% of all the economic activity in the nonprofit sector. Now, hospitals, universities, colleges, they're independent from the government, but they're substantially controlled by government. Community-based groups, which get 16.4% of all nonprofit economic activity, that includes social services, advocacy groups, sports and recreation, international development not substantially controlled by the government, and when they provide goods or services, it's either free or at low prices, like a counseling center. And the category that puzzles everybody, business nonprofits, includes things like business associations. My favorite is the Canadian Potato Chip Marketing Board, whose sole interest is trying to convince us all to eat more potato chips. They are a nonprofit. Unions are nonprofits and fall into this category. If you live in a condo, the Condo Association is a nonprofit. 10.4% of the revenue, not controlled by the government, they do provide the uh, wide range of goods and services, and uh, they may charge significant prices for the surplus they produce. Now, a little data, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but since it's brand new, you may want to explore this in detail. Community groups, get about $65 billion of the $268 billion in economic activity. Governments, hospitals, universities, much more than that. But just looking across that column, that's $11 billion in donations for about 18% of the revenue that comes to the community groups. Governments provide 20 billion dollars in revenue that's about 31 percent sales 18 billion 28 percent and then there's some small amounts from investment income and membership fees now i wish i had the breakdown for specific subgroups of types of community groups i'm hoping that stats can will provide that shortly but fascinating to look at this kind of data in our mistakes of thinking of the wrong way about how much money we get now, I'm going to spend a few minutes on our second most common mistake, and that's not researching potential funders properly. We have to use the directories that are available. I'll tell you more about them in just a moment, and I've got a nice surprise for you. The directories let us find funders and their interests. If you don't have access to a directory, even if you do, you can look at the funders' own websites. That'll provide you with information about their special interests, their application deadlines, how much they'll give, even the names of key people, and you should be Googling them further. Here's a secret tip and one of the most effective. You can look at other charities' annual reports. Usually there's a page, often right at the end, that tells you who funds them. And if you look at charities that are like yours, you can then apply to the foundations and other funders who have funded them. You don't have to feel too guilty that you're going to steal their grants, 
uh, most foundations fund multiple organizations every year. I'd also recommend that you set up Google alerts on your top prospects so that every time something new happens, you're among the very first to know. Now let's go back to these directories. There are four or five major pay to play sources. But the good news, even though they cost thousands of dollars a year to subscribe to, is that most have free trial offers. So they include aja.ca, bigdatabase.ca, charitycan.ca, foundationsearch.ca, which is part of the same organization that runs Big Database. That's why I say four or five. And both Big Database and Charity Can have a wonderful tool that lets you track board members of their foundations to board members on your charity and find connections. Imagine Canada's Grant Connect is one of the best, and here's good news, you can get it free at most public libraries. It costs as little as $85 a month to access, uh, up to several thousand dollars a year. And finally, iWave, uh, which is uh, another extraordinarily good directory. Now here's my Oprah moment. You get a directory, and you get a directory, and I contacted Imagine Canada, and everybody who's registered gets access to Grant Connect for a full week. Your username is OCIC2019, your password is GC123, and you get to log in either to their new Delta version, which is still in beta testing and evolving fast, or the classic version, which will be phased out sometime in the next few months. If you look at the Delta version and see things you don't love, there's a feedback form they would like to hear how they can continue to improve this. So go on there. They fully understand that you are going to um, melt their servers down, looking at all kinds of data on all kinds of possible charities, and uh, save that, print it out, and you will get a very solid introduction to Grant Connect. So yay to Imagine Canada for providing that to us all for free. Here's a screenshot of Grant Connect's classic version, just looking at international development. And as you can see, there are subcategories uh, for other kinds of interests, social services, health, religion, environment, sciences, arts and culture, education, sports and rec. Under international development, there's special interest in Americas, the foreign, foreign affairs, Asia, Middle East, Africa, Europe, international disaster relief. And just in the tab for international development, there are still more subcategories so that you can hone in and narrow your research down to just what interests you most, like human rights or education or food security or children and youth or access to water. This is such a great way to make sure that the people who receive your grant applications actually want to receive your grant applications. You're not wasting your time and you're not annoying powerful funders by telling them um, that uh, you'd like a grant for something that they simply will not fund. There are also several free directories. DevX.com has a great directory that goes globally, not just Canadian. CharityVillage.com has another directory of Canadian foundations. And NOSA Search has not only foundations, also corporations and individual donors. So poke around, take a look at all of these and see which ones suit you the best. A few more from the horse's mouth. Community Foundations of Canada's website is worth looking at. Uh, there are major foundations in Toronto, Ottawa, Vancouver is the oldest and the largest. Philanthropic Foundations Canada is the private and public foundations as opposed to the community foundations, and their website is worth looking at. And if you're raising money for international development, you've got to stay in touch with Global Affairs Canada, so I've included a link for them. Again, you'll get all these slides, so uh, you will be able to click and uh, look around. The third and final of the common mistakes I want to talk about this morning is failure to follow directions. Funders tell us that they regularly get grant applications that do not include all the information they requested or doesn't include it in the way they want. So if they have asked you for your budget, 
you got to include your budget, maybe more than one budget. And you've got to do it in the format they requested. If they say maximum of 100 words, don't try and squeeze in 110. They may tell you that it has to be in a specific font with a minimum size or a maximum size. I've even had funders complain that they said they wanted 13 print copies not stapled and they only got 12, so they threw the whole grant application into the recycling bin. Well, there's a, an old line about what does a 500 pound gorilla eat? Anything it wants. So when the funders tell you to submit their grant applications in a specific format, do it. Otherwise, all of your hard work may be for nothing. Well, that's our common mistakes. Let's move on to our second question. What does it cost to do grant seeking and grant writing? How do you budget for it? Well, everybody's different, but it takes time to create a good grant application. It can take up to 10 days to research and write each and every grant application, particularly when you're new to it. When you're very experienced, you may get it down to only a day or two to produce a grant application, but if you're spending much less time than that, you may be sending in clones, search and replace, cut and paste, and that's a bad idea. Not only because sometimes people forget to remove the name of one foundation when they send it off to another one, whoops, how embarrassing, um, but um, every foundation has different interests, and the more you customize, the better you will be at getting the right grant applications. In addition to writing the applications, you should spend about a half day quarterly, every three months, reporting back to funders on how the money is being spent. So that may be a more standardized uh, set of materials, but you got to stay in touch with them. It's not just uh, get the money once and go away. It's a constant process of stewardship. Time. My experience is that it's about six months on average between the time you submit a proposal to the time you get approval. Now, sometimes that's way faster. Right now, end of March, a lot of government departments are discovering that they have money left in their budget and they need to spend it before the end of April or they will lose it. And they're contacting their favorite funders and saying, have you got a proposal ready for me? And hopefully you've got something that you can send back to them very quickly and you will get your approval within five to six weeks. But most of the time, if you're applying in the spring, you won't hear until the fall. What does it cost? Well, as I said, you can get access to Grant Connect for as little as $85 for one month for a small organization. It can be $1,700 for a year for an organization with uh, more than uh, $5 million in revenue. And yeah, you can hire grant writers to do all of this for you. They tend to charge about $100 an hour. And let me anticipate a question. No, you can't pay them on commission. It's not ethical. Is it all worth it? Well, the average grant in Canada is ten dollars to $20,000. So if you're trying to get a million dollars, you're going to need a bunch of grants. That said, there are certainly some grants that are way larger, and some foundations that'll send you $500, $1,000. So let's be honest about the realities. And about one in 10 proposals submitted is actually approved. 90% failure rate, according to the funders themselves. Now, because you're studying up on this, you're probably more likely to be in the one in 10 that's approved than the really crappy proposals that are sent to the wrong people at the wrong time, miss deadlines and do it all wrong and get rejected. I was asked to talk about how you reach out to a foundation or any potential grantor when there hasn't been a call for proposal or there's been no invitation. It's a tough one. And there are some funders, frankly, that want to be remain, remain anonymous. They insist on their privacy and they won't open your email or your letters. But your best solution is to look for six degrees of separation. Look at the names of the people on the funder's staff or their board members. Often they're on, the, they're on their website or in the directory or in the 
CRA list of funders because all foundations are charities, so their board members are listed there. Find those names, look them up in places like LinkedIn and Google, and see if you know anybody in common, somebody who maybe went to university with them or worked at the same company or lives near them or has a cottage near them or worships in the same place of worship. If you don't have anybody now, well, you start building towards that because we're all gonna be around for a long time. It would be nice to think that if we only got our grants uh, approved this year and we got enough money, we'd never have to do this again. But we know that's not true, realistically. We're gonna be fundraising next year and the year after and 10 years from now. So the process of building our network, it's worth investing some time. If you can find a connection a personal contact, so it's not just, hi, I'm from a charity you've never heard of, would you be willing to give us some money? Person to person, ask to meet for coffee. A short, personal meeting. And if you can get that meeting, spend most of your time asking questions and listening more than you talk. Don't go in and talk at them. In fact, 80% of your time should be spent listening to them. Some of them will refuse to meet you, that's the reality, but if you could possibly get there, I recommend it. And whether you can meet them for coffee, send them your info, but make it clear that if they don't want to receive it, they can opt out. If you have an annual report, send it. If you have a newsletter, send it. Invite them to tour your project, but if your project is in Mozambique, they are paying the cost to fly to Mozambique. If you can make a video, that is much more impactful. We find that people are more willing to watch videos than to read text. And if possible, make it a personalized video where you talk to them by name and reflect their interests. You can also offer them exclusive field reports on what you're doing. Okay, I know it's overwhelming, it's exhausting, but this is the best way to get past that. That said, sure, there are some, many foundations that routinely say, we are inviting proposals, here's the deadline, please submit to us. Dirty money, how do you handle the ethics of it all? Well, it's been in the news in the last few days that several art galleries in England and New York City have turned down million dollar, million euro, millions pounds, gifts from the Sackler Foundation because they made all of their money with selling oxytoxin and making uh, opioid connections and they thought the money was bad. Uh, a couple of days ago a German found a, a company announced that they were going to be giving 10 to 15 million dollars uh, because they realized that during World War II they had uh, used slave labor some charities don't take money from tobacco companies or cannabis companies now that they're legal. Some are unhappy with taking money from the Ontario Trillium Foundation because it's linked to lotteries and gambling. Whatever your issues are, you need to develop your gift and acceptance policies in advance, not in reaction. So sometimes we develop a necessary evil and say, you know, if we were doing money to deal with addiction, we would take money from a company that sold addictive drugs because that's undoing the harm that they did. Or maybe you need to draw the line someplace and say, we absolutely would not take money from companies that have engaged in these kinds of pursuits or the foundations that are in the family name from the company's money. How far back do you go? Are you willing to take money from the Rockefeller Foundation, which made all of its money from uh, oil companies, even though it's separated from those oil companies decades and decades ago? You need to make that determination. And you need to decide whether it's gonna help or hurt people in your projects to take that money. Is it gonna do greater good or greater harm? You also need to think about whether it's gonna drive away other donors because they'll be so mad that you took money from this organization that you they will never contribute to you again. And finally, I hear people saying, well, we would take the money, but it would have to be anonymous. I don't think that solves the problem 
because anonymous gifts sometimes become public. And if it stinks, if it becomes news, if a journalist finds out about it and that embarrasses you, then you probably shouldn't have taken the money in the first place. So my suggestion is um, you've got to decide um, that uh, whether it was publicly known or not, you would take their money. But you might also go go back to a principle that uh, I first heard articulated uh, by Karl Marx. I hope that that doesn't upset anybody if I quote Karl Marx. Um, he said, Geld nicht schmeckt. Gold doesn't stink. Some people are prepared to say, I'll take money from anybody, anywhere, in order to do the best. You got to make your own call. And Rosenfield at Charity Info just ran a great article in the last couple of weeks on how to decide whether to accept the gift. I've posted the link. I strongly recommend you read that article if you have any concerns over filthy lucre. Moving on. How can we share lessons with funders and grantors? Well, they really want to hear from you, actually. Ask them what info they want. And <clears throat> if they expect you to report, do it. Be sure you send them the info when they want it and on time. But even more than that, whether they have told you that they want a report from you, I'd like to invite them right from the beginning to participate in the evaluation of a project, in part because in some cases, they will give you extra funding to do that evaluation once they realize that you take evaluation seriously. Figure out how you can get data collected ethically without invading people's privacy and including your participants appropriately. And discuss the barriers to doing effective evaluation. But by all means, give them honest feedback. If you ran a project and you know what, it didn't really work out all that well, tell them so that they don't spend more money funding the same project over and over again. But yeah, we need to report back. Uh, Engineers Without Borders has started a uh, website called The Failure Report, it's just as we'd want to know if an airplane fell down from the sky, what went wrong, uh, we need to be able to look at our projects on the ground and figure out what was the most effective and the least effective, the most costly or the least costly way of dealing with the important issues. I'd also like to suggest that we share lessons with each other. And to that end, I have another treat for you. I've created a brand new private protected Facebook group for discussions. I've called it the Canadian INGO Fundraising Forum. And the Facebook link is a ridiculously long series of numbers. So when we send this to you, you can log in. Now, this isn't going to be the Ken Wyman forum. forum. It's a cooperative forum with content built by all. And it's not going to be heavily moderated, but it is going to be an opportunity to ta discuss topics like which funders were really friendly and which were a little bit challenging. That's why this is a private forum, not in the funder's view. Are there any changes in funding policies that we'd like to see? Any procedures? Any news on who got funding for what? or who got turned down. An opportunity to discuss ethical dilemmas we might be having in Q&A and, well, anything else you want to talk about. It's your forum to build. So we'll see how that goes. If nobody gets active on this Facebook group, it'll just sit there quietly. But it could be a wonderful opportunity for the ongoing discussion of the questions that we all have, including people who might not have been able to log on today. So that's my time talking at you. I've got some more resources to share on the next slide, but we're at our half time mark. Now we're turning it back to you for your questions and your ideas. I know that we've got a whole bunch of experts online today, people who have been there, done that. So Aliza, if you could moderate some discussion, see what questions people want to ask in the chat room and um, what ideas people want to share. Thank you, Ken. Um, I just want to first check, is everyone hearing me a little bit better right now? Give me, you know, say yes or no in the chat box, if that's yes. Okay. 
Awesome. I'm really glad to hear that. Um, so to avoid having everyone talking at the same time, I would suggest if you have a question, put it in the chat box. And so Ken will be able to see um, your question as well. And Ken, I might ask you to repeat the question for those who might not be able to see the chat box or, or read through it. And so if you have um, you know, any questions for Ken, this is the time when you can put your question in the chat box. How can we share the lessons we learned to our funders? Uh, this is from Oak Ridge's Moraine Land Trust. Um, my first suggestion would be to ask them what they want. Um, some funders get annoyed when material comes in out of the blue, but some are overjoyed. Um, they may even like to convene an Oak Ridge's Moraine Land Trust funders network where they can talk with each other about how to do this important environmental work together. So I would strongly encourage you to reach out to them and simply say, um, what would you like to know about what we've learned? Maybe even suggest some of your top learnings. Um, here's some things that we've learned about dealing with uh, developers or um, species at risk. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, thank you, says Oak Ridge's Moraine. Um, Malfoud says, is there an amount, small or big, that works better? Um, for the amount that you're asking, it should be guided entirely by what the funder's guidelines say, assuming you can find funder's guidelines. If the funder has said, our average rent is 5,000, don't ask them for 500 or 50,000. Uh, beyond that, um, you can try and use the directories to find out how much they funded. Um, you may even be able to tell a, a little bit from other charities like yours, where in the annual report it may have said our bronze, silver, and gold donors, bronze donors gave less than a thousand, silver gave a thousand to 2,500, and gold donors gave more than 25,000 uh, or 2,500, so that you can figure out what that funder most typically gives. Uh, Alexis, any suggestions on how to find religious foundations? Do they suggested databases have filters for that? Um, all the foundations are very aware that there are a number of uh, religious organizations and religious funders, and uh, you can even break that down by denomination, religion, uh, funders who are interested in Christianity, Judaism, um, uh, dialogue between efficacy between AJA and Grant Connect to do research. They're all good. It's really, do you like driving a Volkswagen or a Kia? Uh, what's your favorite vehicle? They all have more or less the same information. They have different ways of indexing it. So I love AJA. I've used it often. I love Grant Connect. I've got to say that right now in Grant Connect, uh, I like the classic version that's only going to be available for a few more months better than I like the indexing in the new Delta version, but they're still working on that. And once I've become more used to the Delta version, uh, it may be uh, easier to search in that as well. So it's really a matter of personal taste. The Alexis remembers the Girl Scouts cookies that I gave out in class at the uh, Humber International Development uh, uh, class. They were the rewards for people who asked good questions. So cookie for you, Alexis. David Barth. Some foundations lists mean gifts and median gifts. I'm guessing that if the mean and median are far apart, 
there might be tons of very small and few very large gifts. Can you elaborate on this, Ken? David, it's true. Um, many foundations, particularly the family foundations, don't like saying no to people, so they will send out token gifts. Now, depending on the size of the foundation, a token might be 500 or 5,000 or 50,000, and there will be a handful where they are totally committed and prepared to give what are, by their standards, really large gifts, whether by them that's a thousand or ten thousand, a hundred thousand, or in a few rare cases, million dollar commitments over several years. And Isabel asks, are there new trends in what the foundations will fund nowadays? You know, I'm not seeing a whole lot of variation. The foundations that exist have been around for a few years, and while some of them do totally radically change what they fund, for the most part, it's the same sort of things that they have funded all along. There are new foundations, and uh, there may be a little bit more interest in the environment over the last year or three. But foundations at least tend not to be as quick to change their priorities as government departments, which change at least with every new election where we get a new party in power that may have a very different view of what should be done, um, and often more frequently. I'm expecting some differences in government funding this year as we move towards the federal election and the Alberta provincial elections. Uh, Ontario government funding not likely to change for the next three years. Uh, so I'm not seeing foundation funding as particularly trend-driven. Standing by for more questions. Or comments. You don't have to just ask a question. You can share something that you tried that worked or failure report, something you tried and found yourself saying, boy, don't do that again. Better warn my friends. you've gotten um, and anybody else feel free to jump in on other sources of grants that you've received. Let's try and build a, well, I won't say a full directory, but a beginning of a list of who's funded who in this room. Has anybody gotten Ontario Trillium grants? Um, bad news, uh, the Ontario government cut the Ontario Trillium grants by, I believe it was $10 million um, in the current year, so there's a little bit less money available for Ontario Trillium. Now that's money that has to be spent inside Ontario. Amy, uh, sorry, Annie, Annie Letourneau has asked, can you comment on the new trends implying that funders tend to collaborate between them and want us to have a concerted approach in our work? Annie, you're right. Um, I'm not sure that this is a new trend, but it's something I've seen many times over the years. Funders, particularly foundations, but I hear this from corporations and to some degree government as well, love it where instead of getting three grant applications from three charities, they get one and we say we'll all work together. That gives them greater confidence that we're well organized and have the capacity to deliver. Um, so uh, that kind of partnership um, is very much uh, on their radar, and it's been a bit of a buzzword for the last few years. So if you can create a, a, a grant application and promise them that you will collaborate and show them who you'll be collaborating with and develop the budget, uh, they really appreciate fewer grant proposals and greater likelihood that everything will be done well. That said, there's a flip side to this. The other trend is that funders are collaborating between each other. And I have seen funders get a grant proposal and send it off to another grantor and say, this looks more like your cup of tea than mine. 
I also had a funder tell me uh, that uh, other funders just like them, they get together for tea or coffee once a month or so, and yeah, they talk about us. So when they've gotten really bad grant proposals um, or uh, they see charities that have failed to deliver, they may let us know. I'm just scrolling up here. David Barth responds, we've received a few grants from the HOP Foundation and we're currently trying to work with the Shaw Foundation. Used to have a staff member that was trying to get funding from foundations, but it wasn't successful and we no longer have dedicated staff for this. We have recently signed up for Grant Advance. We're vetting about 800 foundations before we begin the grant writing process. Oh, I'm told that I missed a question. Um, what's the best approach to work with global affairs, personal contact, or through website? Um, I'm open to anybody commenting on that one. Uh, there's a number of people on this. Um, whether it's through the artists, um, possibly the art lovers, the galleries, the people uh, who are committed to it. Uh, one word about Ontario Trillium Foundation for people who get their grants, they will occasionally provide a three-year grant, isn't that wonderful, but it's at diminishing levels. You get um, the most in the first year, less in the second year, less than the third year hint you're not going to get money from us every year and then they're always frustrated when the people who were told this is a three-year grant not to be renewed come back to them in year four and say more please nope they meant it uh dombrovska what is the best approach to work with global affairs no we did that uh, moving on I feel like I've reached the bottom of the list. Yep. So standing by for more questions. We have about 10, 15 minutes left. So more opportunity to kick ideas around. Standing by. Okay, well, let me share a few more suggestions in the meantime. And uh, if more questions come up, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to come back to them. So I have some resources for you. First and foremost, if you're new to OCIC Money Talks, this is the fourth. In fact, this is the third part of the fourth. So you can go to the OCIC Money Talks link and look at workshops we've done on determining your best fundraising strategy. That was number one. Number two, what's the money for? Building your case for support. And oops, on my slide, I didn't put in a reference to issue number three, which was all about writing grants and you'll find tons of material there on the best way to create a grant proposal, what the best grant proposals include. Um, there's a great deal of material so I will revise these slides to put that in. And then here we are in part three of issue four, let's talk foundations. If you didn't see them, there was a, a wonderful interview with Community Foundations of Canada and with the Canadian Women's Foundation. If you're doing work on women's issues in Canada, you want to look at their material as well. Imagine Canada just put out an excellent article, How to Keep Your Fundraising Proposal Out of the Trash Bin. I strongly recommend you read that. And I've pulled a few more links of other resources, Grant Space and the Grant Helpers blog. 
an article, find out if you should hire a professional grant writer, grantstation.com, and the Grantsmanship Center blog. Um, all of these are resources well worth your looking at. Um, if you're doing the kind of research that David Barth talked about, where you try and look at 800 proposal, uh, possible funders and narrow it down, um, which is a very smart idea, all of these will give you further useful tools. There are also a couple of books which you may be able to find at your local library, or if not, you can buy them uh, in a bookstore, please, a bricks and mortar bookstore. Uh, they will order it for you. And yeah, if you have to, you can order it directly from the publisher or at Amazon. Uh, there are two that I'm recommending for you, Grant Writing for Dummies, and I know there's no dummies on this chat, but it is a very simple, uh, effective tool, and Prospect Research in Canada, uh, which provides an extraordinarily useful look at how to find out more about the donors so that you give them the information they most want to have. Um, I have another question. Are grantors willing to go to social events where people would be interested in dialogue on common issue? Where they could talk with grantors on common issues? Well, the answer is maybe. Some grantors are extroverts and love coming to special events, and some are introverts and love hiding behind their websites and their formal grant proposals. The easy solution is invite them. Even if they don't come, they're likely to appreciate that you have included them and that they had the option of coming. And some of them are also very busy, so give them long advance notice of special events and then send reminders. They may well uh, have two or three events that they have to do in a specific day, uh, and particularly some times of year, such as in December, it can be a very busy social season. So give them lots of advance notice so that they can build it into their calendar. Any other questions? Now, you know that I've been involved with the fundraising program at Humber College for many years. Uh, let me briefly uh, talk about this. If you want to study fundraising, you may want to come and uh, enjoy a one-year grad school experience. But if you want help, our students do internships every year from June to August, working full time in a charity office. So you can get in touch with us. There's our website, humber.ca slash fundraising. You can email our program coordinator, samantha.rogers at humber.ca. She's on sick leave at the moment, but she's got an autoresponder so that uh, we can follow through with other people. And um, Facebook and Twitter um, all uh, provide additional information from us. Follow our Facebook and Twitter accounts because we're constantly posting additional news you can use. And while we're wrapping up, let me say that while I'm asking that you not steal this material, yes, you can share it with your board, your staff, your volunteers, anybody inside your organization. The goal today is to be uh, educational far and above. Another question from the Oak Ridges Moraine. If a foundation supports environmental activities, but doesn't provide details on which ones, should proposals be general to species at risk, or should they be more detailed for one or two specific species? So hard to figure out how to deal with a charity that just won't tell you what their um, greatest interests are. My first choice would be to try and enter into dialogue with them, ask them a question, whether you do that person to person or by email um, or uh, by sending a letter or making a phone call. Uh, ask them what they would like species at risk in general, or one or two specific species. Again, the 500 pound gorilla, they get to decide uh, the answers. But sometimes you can't get in touch with them, you can't ask them. So in that case, my suggestion would be to take the risk of talking about one or two specific species. 
in general, my experience is that funders like to get down to something that is likely to be the most effective rather than talking about wide, uh, wide projects. Uh, that said, there's a risk that you will tell them that you're interested in saving uh, marmots and maple trees and they're only interested in ginkgos and pine trees. Uh, there's a risk that you will choose the wrong two specific species. But if you've Googled them, if you've looked at other um, uh, people that they funded and can't get any information, you're just going to have to make an inspired guess. Oh, by the way, these directories do allow you to search by funder. So if you've been funded by the, um, the Marmot Foundation, or you're thinking you'd like to apply to the Marmot Foundation, I'm making this up, I don't know if there is a Marmot Foundation or not, you can go to any of these directories, plug in the word Marmot Foundation, and see who they have given funds to. It's a, a, a workaround that can get you some additional information. Well, we're about at our time. I'm certainly happy to take additional questions. Um, and uh, Elisa will jump in any moment and um, do some uh, follow up. Yes, um, I hope without the video, it does help a little bit for my audio. Um, so thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing and for the very, you know, helpful slideshows and really helpful presentation to talk about um, grants and fundraising. And I'm really, really impressed by all the great questions that our audience have posed. Um, so again, this webinar is recorded. And usually we will put it onto our website in the next two, three days. So you could expect that if you want to review a little bit. I hope that the, the technical difficulty on my own side would not affect the video recording since it's done through the platform. But if anything, I will let you know and we will have the slides um, available for download anyway. So um, if you have any question for any content that we've covered today, please feel free to contact us to get in touch with Ken. Uh, we will also have a feedback form sent to you by the end of today. And we really encourage um, that, you know, if you have any suggestions for our future, you know, relevant programs, if you have any other topics that you're interested in or you felt like we haven't covered as much, um, please let us know. And any critical, you know, uh, criticism or suggestions are welcome. So, and, oh, yes, and if you haven't, I really strongly recommend you read through our previous interview with Ken that we conducted an interview just last week. And it's now fully available online. It might work a little bit better on a desktop than on your mobile phone. That's what I found. So if you have time, read through that interview transcript. Uh, we talked about the differences between foundation grants and government grants, and how do you determine if your projects are appropriate for a foundation grant, and, and much more. So if you want to have a little bit of preview um, or a little bit of review for today's webinar, please go to ocic.on.ca slash monitalks to find out more and to read our previous issues as well. Okay, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and I really apologize for all the technical issues that's happening here in our office. Uh, but thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you all soon again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.